Pastor and author John Ortberg once wrote, the Holy Spirit says, you are it. You are God's plan. In a thirsty world, people need to be refreshed. It is a broken world, and people need to be healed. Now get out there and do it. You see, as Christians, we talk a lot about Jesus being the answer for what ails this world, right? As we should, because he is the answer for the brokenness all around us. So we should talk about that without question, as long as we understand at the same time that the way Jesus heals the brokenness in this world is through us. Okay, if Jesus is going to touch someone else's life, right? If he's going to provide for someone or extend love and compassion to them or share the truth with them or even heal them, well, he's going to do it through you. And in fact, if that sounds like a, uh, like a significant burden, well, then good, because you're getting the idea. Because when we think about and talk about God's plan for our lives, right? When, when you ask yourself the question, what is God's plan for my life? I think we often forget that at the very center of that plan, there's a cross, a cross which you are required to continually die upon. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In fact, Luke 9.23 says we're to do that daily. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Okay, in the first century Roman world, listen, the cross wasn't a piece of jewelry or a, a, a known symbol of faith. No, in the first century, the cross only meant one thing, death by crucifixion. Jesus was saying, if you're going to be a follower of mine, then you have to live like I do. You have to deny yourself what you want, dying to yourself every day. And then come follow me so you can learn how to share my love and my truth with the world that doesn't know the meaning of either. This has to be, uh, I believe, the most difficult part of the gospel for most Christians to actually take hold of. The part where we accept and embrace the fact that God's unfailing plan for your life, as wonderful as it is, is primarily not about you doing things for you. No, his plan for your life is primarily about you going places and doing things as a member of his body, actually an extension of himself, to a world for which you are the only Jesus some people will ever see. And the irony of it all is that the more you deny yourself by giving your life away to others, the more fulfilling and gratifying your own life becomes. This is the paradox of the gospel. The most self-serving thing you could ever do is to serve others, more specifically to serve Jesus Christ by serving others because it is only then when you're living in the very center of God's unfailing plan for your life that you will ever truly be satisfied, which is also why the enemy's most effective and most often employed strategy in the lives of God's people is to get us to focus on ourselves at all costs. Right, Because that immediately takes us outside of God's will. Listen, he did it with Adam and Eve in the very beginning. He's been doing it ever since, tempting us with the notion that I should tend to myself, to my needs, to my desires first and foremost. And then it's okay for me to do good for others with whatever is left. But you understand, that's not what Jesus did. That's not how he lived his life. And that's not what he taught his disciples to do either because his plan for you is to live a selfless life of service to him by serving others. And what's so amazing about how God works in all of that is the fact that, again, living that way is hands down the best thing you could ever do for yourself. Why? Because of what God does to you and through you when you live like that which is what our story is about today as we continue this sermon series working our way through uh, 1 Samuel. Saul is being prepared by God, un unbeknownst to Saul, to become Israel's first human king. And of course, if you're familiar with the story of Saul's life, you know that the moment he begins to focus on himself in later chapters, that's the moment he wanders outside of God's will. And, and we'll get to all of that as we go. But in the beginning of Saul's story, as he focuses on serving others in the simplest of ways, God does the most amazing things to and through Saul as his unfailing plan unfolds in Saul's life. Which I'm just telling you 
is a lesson that may be needed in the church now more than ever in our lifetime. Because when you look at what is happening in the world today and all around this country, everyone is vying for attention. Everyone wants to put a spotlight on themselves. And of course, uh, uh, look, there are a myriad of very serious and legitimate issues that need to be addressed without question. But look, the last thing the world needs right now The last thing the world needs right now is the church using the suffering that is going on around us as an opportunity to promote ourselves because you and I aren't the answer. Jesus is, which means when the world sees us, they had better see Jesus. What does that mean? It means where there's racism, we need to stand up against it. Where there's oppression, we need to fight against it. Where there are defenseless people being taken advantage of, we need to stand up and defend them because talk is cheap and there are plenty of people talking right now. What the world needs from us is action. They need to see Jesus. By the way, that has to be more than simply participating in some kind of event. It's fine to do that. But serving Christ by serving others is actually God's plan for your entire life, every single day of your life, right? Serving him is supposed to be a daily matter of course in the lives of God's people, which means what? It means serving those who are suffering. It means loving those who have been rejected. It means healing those who are hurting and providing for those who are without every single day of our lives, which also happens to be God's unfailing plan for your life as we're going to see in our story today. So let's pick it back up where we left off last time at 1 Samuel chapter 9, and we'll begin with the first 10 verses. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphiah, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. That doesn't mean he had a really long neck and a giant head. It means he was head and shoulders above the rest. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they, they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. And then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuph, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. And this wasn't Saul being soft, by the way. As we learn later chapters, uh, his father was actually very concerned and anxious about him. So Saul was thinking about his father here. But he said to him, Behold, there's a man of God. This is the servant speaking. There's a man of God in this city, and he's a man who's held in honor. All that he says comes true, so now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone. There is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. So this story opens up with a formal introduction of Saul and his family line, starting with his father, Kish, and then there's a four-generation genealogy, which was typical in ancient Semitic writings when you wanted to convey the importance or the high status of a particular family within a particular tribe. You would list their genealogy. And then when you include the phrase, at the end of verse 1 that describes Saul's father as a man of wealth, uh, which doesn't even come close to, to doing the phrase justice in the ancient Hebrew, which is gibor kayil. It's, it's actually a description of a mighty man of power. It was the same phrase used to describe members of the nobility, particularly those in the warrior class who later became a part of the aristocracy. And then uh, as the story progresses, we learn further on, that Saul's family not only had slaves and donkeys, but also oxen, which was very rare to have all of that. So it starts to become very clear that this was one of the most influential families in all of the tribe of Benjamin. And so Saul's pedigree 
is second to none among the Israelites in his tribe. And on top of all that, there are multiple allusions, as you've just read, to his physical stature, right? Including his height, uh, the fact that he was taller than any of the other Israelites and handsome, the best looking among them as well, which when you read this at a sort of cursory reading, it seems like a fairly random and odd detail to throw into the story. And yet there's actually a very good reason for this, uh, for including this physical description of the man who is soon to be their king. If you were here two weeks ago, you'll remember that the Israelites back in chapter 8, verse 5, were demanding a king, and I'm quoting, just like all the nations. And if you read it in the, in the ancient language, it was just like all the pagan or Gentile nations around us. They were rejecting God as their king. And here's the crazy part about that. When you look at the people groups described as being tall, particularly tall in the Hebrew Bible, it was always the same uh, as uh, the same as all of the people that were described as tall were always described as the enemies of Israel. So just an example or two. The Nephilim, Numbers 13.33, the, the Emim and the Anakites in Deuteronomy 2.10. Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 4, the four descendants of the giants from Gath, including the giant with six fingers and six toes in 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 22. There was a notable Egyptian enemy in 1 Chronicles eleven twenty three. the Cushites in Isaiah 18, 1 and 2, the Sabians in Isaiah 45, 14, and the Amorites in Amos 2, 9, just to name a few of them. In other words, God's saying, you're, you're telling me you want a king just like all the pagan nations around you, and that is exactly what you're going to get right down to the last detail. So this was an impressive specimen of a man from a powerful, wealthy, influential, highly respected and prestigious family. He looked the part of a king and now he's being sent out this highly respected family member, the son of this uh, patriarch of a family in Benjamin is being sent out to find some lost donkeys. That is as thankless a job as anyone could do. And it was certainly a job anyone could do. And yet Kish, this powerful, wealthy, influential man, sends his own son, who notably, by the way, we hear no protest from. Saul simply just goes out and does what his father tells him to do. And in the bare limestone hills of Ephraim and the surrounding areas, loose farm animals could stray a long way. And so Saul and his servant travel for several days, basically in a large circle, if you're looking at the map, and they return close to Ramah without locating the donkeys. And so they come to Zuf, the land of Samuel's ancestor Zuf in the hill country of Ephraim. And Saul surveys the situation. Okay, not only are they out of food, as far as he knows, they're out of money, they're out of supplies, and there are no donkeys in sight. And he's also thinking about his father, who at this point is probably more concerned about his missing son than he is his missing donkey. So Saul suggests that they head back home empty-handed in pretty much every way. Until Saul's servant suggests that they attempt to make contact with the local man of God first. And in the Old Testament, the terms seer, prophet, and a man of God were almost used indistinguishably. So Saul would have known that this servant was referring to a prophet. And yet at this point, again, as far as Saul knows, they're out of everything. They're out of food, they're out of money, they're out of supplies. So he says to his servant, listen, if we go, what can we bring the man? For, for the bread in our sacks is gone. We don't have any food, right? There's no present to bring them in. We have no money. We have no supplies. I got nothing for him. What do we have? It was customary in antiquity to take a present or an offering, some money, something, when you were seeking the help of a seer. Uh, we see that in Amos 7, 12, 1 Kings 14, 3, 2 Kings 5, 5, chapter 8, 8 through 9. They're all examples of that as exchanging gifts. It was an integral part of these social dealings in the ancient world in general, and more specifically, it was a common courtesy when consulting with a prophet. And so the servant reveals to Saul that he has a quarter of a shekel of silver stashed away. So down to their last penny, and yet they're more than willing to pay it and continue to go without food or supplies if it means getting Saul's donkeys back to his father. Okay, For, uh, for all of Saul's shortcomings, for all of his sin and disobedience, all which comes out in later chapters... Uh, listen, he didn't start out that way because he wasn't focused on himself at this point in his life. He was focused on serving someone else, in this case, his father. 
to the point he's even willing to go hungry and without any other supplies for travel if it means being able to help his father find these lost animals. And yet this is also a last-ditch effort for Saul who has already brought up their lack of supplies, their lack of money, and the extended time they've been away wandering around the hill country of Ephraim. Okay, for Saul, hungry, broke, far from home, no closer to his goal now than he was when he started. This has to feel like the most insignificant, self-defeating, random set of circumstances of his entire privileged life. And yet, as we'll see soon enough, this was not only all God's doing. It was these very circumstances, these miserable, seemingly random, insignificant circumstances that God was using to lead Saul straight into his destiny as king okay listen god has an unfailing plan for your life he does it's a plan that he authored for you long before you were ever born psalm 31 uh, 9 psalm 139 16 says every single one of your days were written in his book when as yet there was none of them so every day every moment every breath you take factors into God's plan for your life, which means no matter how miserable, no matter how random or how seemingly insignificant the direction of your life may feel to you at any given point in time, in every single one of those days, even the miserable, random, insignificant, forgettable days, God is leading you. He's always leading you, and where God leads you is exactly where he wants you. Saul never could have imagined that day the destiny that he was getting ready to walk into, and yet literally overnight, everything in his life was about to change because even in those barren hills, hungry, broke, and exhausted, he was exactly where God wanted him to be. Listen to me. I know for some of you, you feel like you're wandering right now in your life. I get it. You're like your life has no real direction, no significant purpose, no light of the end of the tunnel you feel like you're in. And as long as it has felt that way, you still don't feel one day closer to the life you've been longing for. I am telling you, as far away from your destiny as you may feel right now, you are exactly where God wants you to be because you didn't get to where you are by chance. In fact, there's no such thing as chance in God's kingdom. There's only him, his people, and his unfailing plan for your life. Which means you got to where you are because God's unfailing plan for your life has led you there. And as much as you can't see it from where you're standing now, I'm telling you, just over the next hill, your destiny awaits. And when you get there, everything in your life is going to change. And, and, and by the way, it's not as if you don't have a part to play and God's plan for your life coming to fruition. Certainly you do. We'll talk about that in a moment. But listen, his plan for your life is, is an unfailing plan. It cannot be overcome by the plans of the enemy. You understand that, right? right? The enemy's not in control. The, the, God's plans for your life can't be overcome by the plans of this world. Not even the mistakes you make along the way. You understand, your mistakes cannot overcome God's unfailing plan for your life. I'm sorry, you're not that powerful. Now listen, how everything plays out in your life, that plan, the timing of it all, well, that's certainly affected by our response to his leading. And so our disobedience, which is dealt with again in the coming chapters, that certainly plays into how things unfold in our lives. In other words, how well we follow his leading can affect the quality and timing of the journey without question. And, and uh, you understand, by the way, uh, we're not talking about lost people here, unbelievers. That's an entirely different sermon. Right now, we're talking about born-again believers and followers of Jesus Christ, God's people. Your sins have been atoned for. Every sin you've ever committed, every sin you're ever going to commit has been washed away, atoned for on the cross by Jesus Christ, and your eternal destiny has been sealed forevermore. And yet, things like disobedience obviously still matter. They're paramount, in fact, in affecting your journey with God, which again, we'll get into more in the weeks ahead. The point being, 
What you do or don't do can have a direct bearing on how long it takes you to get over that next hill and into your destiny in Christ. In other words, he's, he's always leading, right? But we still have to follow, which calls attention to another aspect of this story with Saul that I want to point out because if Saul had been primarily focused on himself on this journey to find these lost donkeys, he probably would have gone home long before now. Yet he continues to press on. Why? Because his primary focus wasn't on himself. It was on serving his father. And it's, re it's really important that we get this before we move on. Because the only way you will ever discover your calling in this life is through serving others. I'm just telling you, it's impossible for you to discover God's calling on your life while you're serving yourself. Why? Because God's calling on your life is not about you serving you. It's about you serving him by serving others. And so look, if you're serious about wanting to fulfill the call of Christ on your life and yet you have yet to discover how you're supposed to do that, then I'm just telling you, start serving God's people. Start serving God's people. It doesn't matter how. You just start serving. And I guarantee you, you will find your purpose. It may not be immediately, but you will over time through faithful, committed service. Look, it doesn't matter if it's not your passion. It doesn't matter if it's not your ideal area of ministry. It doesn't matter if it's not always something you love doing. It doesn't matter. Just serve. And of course, uh, look, where you begin may not be where you end, right? The area of service or ministry that you end up in may not be where you start, but I promise you, the way you get there to your destiny, God's calling in your life, is by serving other people, even if you don't start where you end up. I served in many different areas of ministry as an adult for about 18 years before I was ever given the opportunity or even came to the realization that God created me to be the pastor of a local church. And yet that realization only came, you hear me, it only came because I was already serving in the local church in about every other area you could imagine. And through that faithful service in nearly every other area of ministry that I didn't feel called to except this one, through those years of faithful service, a lot of long, at times frustrating, seemingly random, insignificant, forgettable days. You have no idea how much snow I shoveled around the church in Alaska where I work. Right? When you're, when you're in your mid-40s and you're just out there pushing snow all day and thinking, what am I doing? But one day I was given the opportunity to fill in in a senior pastoral position, just to fill in position while the church was looking for a permanent, uh, someone permanently to fill that, that spot. But you get the fact that the only reason I was even asked to fill in was because I was already serving in that church faithfully. And through that experience, what had never once entered my mind in my entire life, as I stood behind a pulpit that day and preached my first sermon, all of a sudden became crystal clear. I'm supposed to pastor a local church. This is what God designed and created me for. And it only took me 18 freaking years of service to figure it out. Come on. Now I look back, and the whole time I can see now God was leading me. He was leading me, even in the mundane, forgettable days, the insufferable setbacks, even times when it felt like I was wandering aimlessly. I can see so clearly now how all the while I was exactly where I was supposed to be, when I was supposed to be there, because God was leading me the whole time. It turned out it was his unfailing plan for my life, even though I couldn't always see it at the time. So look, don't stop serving. Even when it feels like you're aimlessly wandering, keep serving Christ by serving others faithfully. And I promise you, his unfailing plan for your life, including all those days when it seems like what you're doing is insignificant, right? Mundane, forgettable. You'll look back even on those days and you'll realize Jesus was leading you through it the whole time. Author Mark Hart says, the man who built the manger 
had a purpose in mind. God had another. You'll never know how far-reaching God's plan is for your work. Let's keep reading verses 11 through 21. As they went up on the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he's just ahead of you. Hurry, he's come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you'll find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I've seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered, Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost for three days... Do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? (laughs) Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? So Saul and his servant approached the city, which is on a hill, but the water supply for the city, the springs and wells were typically found in the lower elevations down in the valleys. And it was generally the young maiden's job to walk down daily to those sources of water. So Saul and his servant approached the city well, and they asked the young women if the seer is in the city, to which they reply, he is. Behold, he's just ahead of you. Hurry. He's just now come to the city. So Samuel has just returned from traveling as usual circuit, which we saw back in chapter 7, verse 16, acting as Israel's chief prophet and judge, which to the unbeliever, uh, right, this set of circumstances would seem like an extraordinary stroke of good luck for Samuel to just happen to be arriving at the very moment Saul and his servant, after searching for donkeys for several days, walk into the city. And yet as the story continues to uh, unfold clearly, it becomes uh, obvious that this was no stroke of luck at all. This was the hand of God at work as his plan for Saul continues to unfold, as verse 15 tells us. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time I'll send to you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him prince over my people Israel. And sure enough, right on cue, the next day Saul walks into the city. Verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. Right? Obviously, God is way ahead of everyone else in this story, working things out before them exactly as he had it planned. And so the two meet, and Samuel says to Saul, I'm the seer, go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go, and I'll tell you all that is on your mind. And the full name of Samuel's city, by the way, was Ramathame. It's translated literally as two hills. So you had the city on one hill, and then the high place where they made sacrifices was another hill next door. So Samuel says, go up to the other hill and wait for me there so we can eat together. And by the way, don't worry about your donkeys. They've been found. Oh, and one more thing. You're the man that all of Israel has been waiting for. You and all your father's house. To which Saul replies, Dude, I'm just looking for some donkeys. Right? Am I not a Benjaminite? From the least of the tribes of Israel, is, is, not, is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Like, why are you saying this to me? Right? Although Sam, by the way, Saul's family was wealthy and prominent in the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was nearly wiped out back in Judges chapter 20. And being the youngest of Jacob's 12 sons, Benjamin's family line was rather undistinguished compared to the others. So understandably, Saul's standing before Samuel, dumbfounded. As far as he knows, he's just looking for some donkeys. 
And yet as he walks into this city, he immediately meets this man, this seer, this powerful prophet, the greatest prophet in all of Israel who walks right up to him. He already knows who Saul is. He already knows what Saul is doing. He knows all about the donkeys and where they are. And to top it all off, he invites Samuel to dinner and says, you are the guest of honor because you're the one we've all been looking for. This is just like God. While you're out on what seems like a fool's errand, so far away from where you think your life should be, not doing what you're convinced you should be doing with your life, and all the while God is preparing the next leg of your journey ahead of you, which is precisely how God works in the lives of his people. Okay, When God calls you, he goes before you. Listen, as human beings, we're limited by space and time. That is an inescapable reality of the human condition. We cannot go back to the past and change what already has happened, and we cannot travel into the future and determine what is yet to happen, right? We know that. The problem is we tend to assign our own human limitations to God. It's our nature to interact with God in a way as if he's somehow contained by the same limitations we are. But God is uncontainable. God has no limitations. He dwells outside of space and time. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful over all of space and time all at once. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing and in control of all space and time all at once. And so he's with you right now, and he always will be. Jesus said, behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 20. But listen, he's not just with you right now. He is in your future right now, aligning all of your circumstances and all of your encounters and all of your relationships ahead of time. Why? So that his unfailing plan for your life unfolds exactly as he planned it. It's also why the Apostle John said this is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we've asked of him, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, because God has already gone ahead of you. He's already established his unfailing plan for your life so that when you pray according to what has already been accomplished for you, it's guaranteed to happen. Why? Because it's already been accomplished for you. God's already gone before you and taken care of it. It's also why he calls us to follow him. Because he wants to lead you down that path that he's already prepared and laid out for you as you continue to serve him in his will for your life through serving others. And yet the problem for most of us is, if if we're just going to be honest and real for a second, we spend most of our prayer life not trying to follow God, but actually trying to convince him to follow us. We do. We pray. Hey, God. So here's what I'm thinking. Here's, here's, here's where I'm trying to get to. This is what I want. And so this is what I'm going to need from you in order for this plan, my plan, to work out. Do you understand when, when we pray like that, what you're doing is you're trying to lead God where you're going instead of following him where he's going. So how should we pray? We should pray, God... Please reveal the next step in your unfailing plan for my life to me. And then whatever it takes, help me to faithfully follow you there as I continue to serve you right where I am today. That's called praying according to God's will, not your will. And when you pray according to his will, you're guaranteed to get what you're asking for. Why? Because he already went there. He's already gone ahead of you. He's already prepared the way and provided for what you need which means you don't have to fret about tomorrow. You don't have to fret about tomorrow. Look, with everything going on in our world right now, with all of what seems to us to be uncertainty, we don't have to fret about tomorrow because God is already there taking care of tomorrow for you. And so instead of being fearful about tomorrow, let's just be faithful for today. Let's just be faithful to follow him down the path of his unfailing plan for our lives by serving him as we serve others, even when you can't see what tomorrow holds. A.W. Tozer once said, God's plan will continue on God's schedule. 
Let's finish the story for today. Verse 22 to the end of the chapter. Then Samuel took Saul and his young men and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. Samuel said, see what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day, and when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. In uh, ancient Hebrew culture, the seating arrangement at a dinner table had a special protocol, and to be at the head of the table was a very high honor. On top of that, Saul is given the leg of meat, which was the portion set aside normally for the priests, according to Exodus 29:27. This was a sacred portion of food given uh, uh, to Saul. And then returning to the city after the meal, Saul is given the most desirable sleeping location of all, the very top of the roof where the cool night breeze all night long makes for the best sleeping conditions. And then finally the next morning, Samuel himself escorts Saul to the edge of the city. That was an honor in and of itself to have the man of God escort you out to the edge of the city where he there reveals God's plan for Saul to be the king of Israel. Are you kidding me? Yesterday, he was wandering around hungry, dead broke, looking for some stinking donkeys. What an astoundingly unpredictable turn of events for Saul. One day ago, he's wandering the countryside, hungry, broke, without any hope of finding his father's livestock. And now, after being the honored guest at a feast, at Samuel's table of all people, fed the very choicest food, given the finest place to stay. And if you read on into the next chapter, right there in the edge of the city, he is anointed by Samuel. He's anointed as king. And then he's provided for, for the next step, the next leg of his journey in God's plan for his life. What a drastic turn of events as God so unexpectedly provides exactly what Saul needed to carry out God's plan for his life in that very moment which is exactly how God works in the lives of his people today, okay? What God plans for you, he will provide for. Now look, God will never call you to something that he won't equip you for. But that doesn't mean he's going to give you everything you need before you even get started. Because most of the time he gives you what you need as you need it. Yet I can't tell you how many people I meet with who are by their own admission not yet doing what they know God has called them to do in their lives. And you ask them why and they'll tell you it's because they don't have everything they need to carry that out. As if they can't do anything until they have everything. And I'm just telling you, if you are waiting for everything you need to do, everything God has called you to do before you do anything, you're going to be waiting for a very long time. Okay, for Saul to be able to set out on the next leg of his journey with God, he needed a good meal, a solid night's rest, and a little bit of direction. And that's exactly what he got from Samuel, exactly what was needed, exactly when it was needed. Look, if Saul had stayed at the edge of that town after Samuel anointed him king and said, okay, good, as soon as my army shows up, As soon as my army shows up with my chariots and my weapons to take me to my palace, the seat of my wealth and power, then I'll start off on my next leg of my journey, the next chapter of my story. You know what would happen? The dust left from Saul's dead body would still be sitting there on the edge of that town today because that's not how God works. No, he progressively leads you down the path of his unfailing plan for your life every single day. That's why you have to take up your cross daily and follow him because every single day he gives you exactly what you need to face the challenges of that calling for that day exactly when you need it. 
Do you believe that? Good. Then what are you waiting for? If you're not doing what you know God has called you to do, then what are you waiting for? When we started this church, we didn't have all the money we needed. We didn't have any money. We didn't have all the experience or or wisdom or talent that we needed. We didn't have all the people that we needed. In fact, In fact, what we didn't have, that list was much longer than what we did have. But it turns out we had what we needed for that first step, that first day, that first service, that first sermon, that first group of people who would walk through our doors and come to find out that's all we needed for that day. And it's been that way every single day since. Because that's how God works. Okay, Pastor Rob. So what do I do now? I know what God has called me to, and I know I don't have everything I need to carry out that calling. So so what am I supposed to do? How do I get started? The answer is start serving. Doesn't matter where. Doesn't matter how. The fact that where you start may not be where you end up. It doesn't matter. Just start serving Jesus Christ by serving other people like he did. It's called following him. And as you do that, he will lead you exactly where you need to be, exactly when you need to be there, with exactly what you need to carry it out all along the way which is his unfailing plan for your life. It's not primarily about you doing things for you. No, it's about you going places and doing things as he leads you and provides for you day after day after day, sharing the love of Christ and the truth of Christ with a world that doesn't know the meaning of either. And my goodness, if ever in our lifetime this world needed the love and truth of Christ, it's now which means we need to do more than uh, attend an event and make a meaningful post on social media. That's great. But you understand if Jesus is actually going to touch someone's life, if he's going to provide for someone or extend love and compassion to them or share truth with them or heal them, he's going to do that through you, not a post on social media. How? He's going to do that through you. How? As you provide for them, as you love them, as you share the truth with them, as you mend them, you have to be there. You have to be there. That sounds like a significant burden. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It also happens to be God's unfailing plan for your life. Let's pray.